Welcome back to the Evolving Warfighter. My name is Dr. Franklin Annis, and I'm very excited to have Donald Robertson back with me today uh, to talk about his brand new book, uh, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. Uh, it's such an exciting book, and I'm, I'm glad to have you back on. So thank you, sir. Thanks, Franklin. It's a pleasure to come along. I've got the book here. I might as well do a little plug for it. There you go. That's the cover. So, uh, yeah, and I, I'm sitting in front of the Roman city of Carnuntum as well, so that's kind of cool. Uh, I'm in Austria at the moment, and I've been speaking to the staff, the experts in the museum here, so uh, taking a lot of photos and videos around the, the Roman reconstructions and archaeological sites. Okay. Well, I think the last time I had the chance to talk to you was about nine months ago, and we had a, a good interview about how we could use stoicism to increase the resilience of uh, yeah. military members and not to retread some ground. Uh, I'll leave a link to that interview at the end of this video and uh, down in the low bar below. And that covers a lot of things that are also covered in this book, like the difference between the capital S stoicism being a virtue driven philosophy versus the lowercase stoicism that we might understand in pop culture as kind of this emotionless uh, outlook on life, which isn't what we're discussing today. Yeah. Um, so we'll skip through, uh, well, not repeat those questions, and we'll get into this really interesting book. And I must say that this book uh, was one of the most fascinating ones I've read, uh, at least recently, and it did several things for me, kind of expanded or made me rethink the way I approached Marcus Aurelius and uh, maybe stop me from framing him just as an old man in my mind, but have his whole entire life there. Uh, but it combines several different elements from military history to psychology to philosophy in an interesting way that's kind of a really great introduction to this whole very topic of Marcus Aurelius, who he was and how his philosophy impacted him and more importantly, how we can use that same philosophy today to better our own lives. So I'm sure I could ask you probably four hours of questions on this book because it's such a huge topic and it was such an interesting book. Uh, but I tried to organize my uh, questions into three kind of broad topics. So first I want to talk about the approach you took to writing this book, uh, uh -huh. some of the military history, and then a little bit of the practical self-development that you give inside the book. So with Sounds that, good. Yeah. So with that, I know... Well, like I said before, such an interesting mix of topics in this book. How did you go about, or what was the original idea behind writing this book, and did you achieve what you, you had it intended? Well, in a way, it had to do with my little girl. Uh, I've got a daughter called Poppy, and probably when I started working on this, she was about five years old. And since she was about four or five, I've been telling her stories. She's very demanding and asking me all the time to tell her more and more stories. And uh, I tell a story every bedtime and every time we're kind of like traveling around or whatever, she's always asking me for stories. So I told her stories about Greek mythology because that was what I knew. And then I, I kind of somehow just naturally started to tell her about Socrates and Diogenes and the various anecdotes about the philosophers, many of which come down to us in a book called The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers by Diogenes Laertius. But we have some, some other sources as well. And... Um, she, she really liked that, and it got me thinking that in the ancient world, philosophy was handed down in dialogues and letters and lectures, but also in the form of these little stories and anecdotes. Everyone knows the story, for instance, about Diogenes the Cynic and Alexander the Great and how Alexander said, is there anything that I can do for you or give you? And Diogenes said, yes, can you just step aside because you're blocking the sun? And there's lots of little anecdotes like that in Greek and Roman philosophy, and they help to, to communicate the values of the philosophers and some of their concepts. And I realized they were suitable for kids, but also it's a good way for adults to learn. And I realized when I was reading the meditations that the Stoics also thought it was important to learn from role models rather than just attending lectures. And also they would reflect on these role models in their mind and their imagination. And book one of the meditations is completely dedicated to that. The whole of book one, Marcus talks about his teachers and his family members and the characteristics he remembers and admires about those individual people rather than just him reflecting on abstract stoic theory as it were. So I thought um, I'd like to write another book about stoicism. I'd like to do it in a totally different way from the ones that I've written before. Or they, they, there are many books on stoicism now that are really good introductions but I wanted to do something a bit different. So I thought well it'd be nice to write 
stories um, based on real historical figures. And the most obvious candidate would be Marcus Aurelius, because as emperor, we have several accounts of his character and his reign in surviving Roman history. So we know more about him as a person because he was famous than about the founders of Stoicism, for example, although he was kind of the last famous Stoic we know most about him. And I realized that it, there are lots of biographies of Marcus um, that I really enjoy, but none of them really talk about his philosophy. It would be like talking about somebody who's a devout Christian, but never really mentioning their, their Christian faith or values as a way of explaining their life. And I always felt that was a serious shortcoming. Um, so I wanted to talk about Marcus's life and intertwine what we know about his external life as emperor from the Roman histories with what we know about his inner life as a philosopher from the meditations and kind of weave these two things together because I think they complement uh, one another at certain points. And that's what I attempted to do. I thought hopefully it would also provide a more rounded and balanced picture of Stoicism because I feel that some of the most common misconceptions about Stoicism are most easily addressed by pointing to living historical examples of real Stoics. Um, for example, you know, the idea that Stoics are just kind of cold and unemotional. Uh, Marcus wasn't like that at all. He was an extremely affectionate and loving man. And uh, the idea that Stoics are kind of accept things so that would make them passive, like they'd be sitting on their hands, is completely at odds with what we know about Marcus's character and his life. So kind of rectifying that by putting a human face on Stoicism was one of my goals. And, you know, hopefully I achieved that because people who have looked at the book so far say it, it, it gives them a slightly different perspective on, on what it would be like to be a Stoic. Yes, well, it definitely changed my perspective looking at it. Um, and this would be, I think, a great text, especially for anyone trying to get into Stoicism to read this book before the meditations. It would definitely uh, kind of reframe how you'd look through the, the, the meditations. Yeah. I think that I've also met, people sometimes say to me that they, they just want to read the meditations and not kind of look beyond it. They think that's sufficient. But my experience, it really isn't. Like when people learn more about Marcus's life and they dig more deeply into the text and the historical context, they get twice as much out of the meditations because suddenly it, it becomes enriched and it means more to them. Um, I mean, for a start, in book one, he talks about all these people. Well, it's useful to know who they were and what his relationship with them was like, and then we can kind of understand more about why he's saying those things and what the, the significance of them really is. One way I would put it is, you know, when we talk about Stoicism, it can seem a little bit abstract when we're talking about the ancient text. But in this book, what I'm trying to do is point to a Stoic. So when people say, what is Stoicism? We can point at this guy here and say, this, here's, a, here's an example of a Stoic. And, uh, you know, like I say, that gives us a little bit more of a balanced picture of what it means. So what resources did you draw upon when you're looking for uh, or trying to assemble these, this life story? Well, lots, right? So they, there are lots of good biographies, modern biographies. So there's Frank McClinton's, Frank McClinton's biography. Uh, I actually prefer, that's the most popular one. I prefer Anthony Burley's biography, incidentally. There's Michael Grant's book and the Antonines. And then there's a bunch of other sort of older biographies. There's a lot of biographies of Marcus. But like I say, they don't really go into his philosophy that much. And then we have the actual primary sources, as it were, the Roman histories. So there are bits and pieces in various texts, but mainly we have Cassius Dio, the Historia Augusta, and Herodian are our kind of three main sources for the reign of Marcus Aurelius. And then, of course, we have the Meditations itself. We have also, in addition to that, a cache of letters between Marcus Aurelius and Fronto, Marcus Cornelius Fronto, his rhetoric tutor, um, and those are like our main sources. And then, you know, here at Carnuntum, for example, we have nuministic, like evidence from sort of coins and inscriptions and, uh, you know, archaeological finds and so on that help to shed a little bit of, of light on things. Well, for example, one of the experts here, the scientific director at Carnuntum, told me that they, they found uh, an inscription by a member of the Praetorian, uh, it was, uh, I think, a... Um, a funeral inscription for a member of the Praetorian Guard who had died here in 171 AD. And uh, now, if a member of the Praetorian Guard was here, then that tells them that Marcus Aurelius must have been here uh, at that time. So that confirms that Marcus at least was here in that particular year. So we've got these bits of evidence as well, in addition to the textual evidence. Did you find anything in your research that really surprised you? 
Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of things. I'd say, you know, there's a bigger picture thing. And, you know, maybe this seems like stating the obvious. I think a good way of explaining it, actually, I was talking to the experts here about this the other day, when you get really into reading the meditations, I think there's a kind of illusion that comes with it. So the meditations is written in such a way that it seems very personal and intimate. And Marcus kind of seems like an ordinary guy. And, and it makes you forget that he was in command of the largest army ever assembled on a Roman frontier. And so when you're here at Carnuntum and you're kind of learning about the environment that he was in, it reminds you how big a deal he was. You know, sometimes it's you kind of lose sight of the power that he commanded and uh, the, the busyness of his life, uh, the responsibilities that he had when you're absorbed in the text of the meditations because he's talking about little birds flitting around and eating uh, pork and drinking wine and things like that. And then it, there's very little reference to matters of state or the Marcomannic Wars and so on, this kind of, these world historic events that he was at the centre of. So that kind of getting more of a sense of, of his importance and the scale of the operations around him um gave, you know was was kind of eye opening i kind of knew this already but it brought it home and then one of the other things i suppose there's little details like uh that are kind of nice in the histories like the romans we'll talk later about some of the battles and things but the the romans say that they were surprised to find when they were fighting the sarmatians that after the battle when they inspected the the corpses and removed the, the great helms that they wore and uh, that some of the, the warriors they'd been fighting turned out to be women. And, uh, you know, that's been confirmed by archaeological finds where the mass graves of Sarmatians in armour have been found, and it was discovered that I think one in every ten of them was a, a female skeleton. Um, so there's kind of interesting little details like that. Yeah. No, that's quite interesting. Well, with that, we'll transition into some of the military history that you have in this book, I do know that you describe kind of one tactical engagement where uh, the Roman infantry kind of knowingly march out on this frozen river to fight with uh, Salmatian cavalry, which they had been defeated kind of in this style before. So essentially walking into an ambush and somehow they managed to pull off a of victory. Yeah. Could you tell that story? Some of the kind of bigger picture about the history of the Marcomannic War is a little bit vague and some of the chronology is kind of uncertain, unfortunately. And then we have these really vivid descriptions. And Cassius Dio, he's kind of describing Marcus's reign. And then it's almost like he gets really excited and goes in. It's like he's saying, I need to tell you about this. Like, and he goes into this detailed story about a particular battle that sounds like it must have been, I think, late in the first Marcomannic War. And it sounds like it's being portrayed as a kind of turning point in the war that the, the Romans have kind of struggled uh, to, you know, identify the right tactics. And then they've suddenly kind of like, discovered a way of reversing these ambushes, as it were. So my understanding is the Sarmatians would typically cross the Danube, which marked the frontier in the winter in particular. They would uh, ride over the ice and then loot uh, Pannonia. And uh, the Romans would wait for them to do that and normally attack them when they were laden with goods that they were carrying, perhaps also slaves that they were carrying back uh, across the, the border, across the frontier. And so the, the Sarmatians would sometimes try and lure the Romans into a trap where they would be crossing the river, and as the Romans were following them, there would be horsemen concealed in the forest on the other bank, and they would ride out and I think try to kind of surround them in a pincer manoeuvre. Um, so they would charge them on the ice because the way that the Romans would normally defend against a cavalry charge would be using this thing called the hollow square formation where the legionaries would um, form four walls of a square with their shields locked together um, so that they were, if they were surrounded uh, they'd be protected and in particular the, the weaker troops like the skirmishers and the officers would be on the interior. But, and that usually worked pretty well unless their formation was broken and they were thrown into disarray, and then, and then in which case it would go really badly for them. So either it worked really well or really badly. And the problem was that when they were on the ice and the Sarmatians charged them and their lances hit their shields off and they would just slip and lose their footing, uh, the Romans would, be, would fall like skittles and then they'd be massacred on the ice. But eventually they figured out a way to resist the cavalry charge by 
um, legionaries on the interior of the square putting their shields on the ice and kind of, I guess, re bracing a foot against it to lock it in place. And then the legionaries forming the wall on the outside would be able to brace their rear foot against these shields so that they would be able to retain their footing and resist the, the cavalry charge. And then once they'd done that, they'd kind of separate the shields and skirmishers would run out and jump up and grab the bridles of the horses and pull them sideways so they'd slip on the ice. And once the Sarmatians were dismounted in that way, the Romans stood a much better chance of, of defeating them because they were stronger in close quarters combat like that. And Cassius Dio talks about how they would use their experience of wrestling um, to throw the Sarmatians if one landed on top, the Roman pull them on top and then use his feet to kick him off like so that he would get on top of the enemy. And that was how they eventually learned to reverse these ambushes and defeat them. Yeah. Which is... Quite interesting. I think you talk about the discipline it would take to privately train or secretly yeah. train these soldiers to do it and just have infantry knowing, knowingly stand against cavalry because through most of history, cavalry could very easily defeat infantry. Yeah, what was it like the first time they did this? Yeah. You know, <laughs> we've come, we're going to try this thing where we send you out on the middle of the ice. <laughs> like yeah. I know we've not really done it. We've been practicing it. Uh, we reckon it's going to work. Let's go and see. Um, must have been pretty scary. Yeah. You you have a lot in this book about Marcus Aurelius, and at least from the military aspect, we take a look at him and say he was a pretty remarkable strategist. So uh, even though he was considered kind of the last of the great emperors, he had to deal with a number of wars, whether it was a border war or a civil war, and he, well. He was essentially a military general, which we don't always picture him because we think, oh, here's a statue of kind of this old man dressed in kind of the philosopher's toga. He's not really, we don't instantly think of a Roman kind of legionary type uh, mindset that he had. Um, but his philosophy really helped shape his, um, his approach to strategy on the battlefield. Could you talk about how... Um, Stoicism kind of influenced the the end of the civil war he fought, and whether it made the the war easier to win. The civil war with Avidius Cassius, um, I maybe well, I'll say a little bit about how that arose. Like Marcus originally had a co-emperor for the first time. There were two emperors. His adopted brother Lucius Verus ruled alongside them. And, uh, and shortly after they were acclaimed emperors, the Parthians invaded Armenia, which was a Roman client state. And so the Romans suffered a bad defeat at that point, and they had to send an army to, to liberate Armenia and to, to fight the Parthians back. And uh, Lucius Verus at that point was marked out as the one who was in command of the, the legions, uh, although Marcus was possibly involved in, in some of the strategizing from, from back at Rome. Um, but it was mainly Lysias that, that was the one that was involved with the military, but he didn't do a very good job of it. And also shortly after the end of the Parthian War was the outbreak of the Antonine Plague and Lysias died um, kind of prematurely um, and Marcus was left on his own as sole emperor. And so it seems that he was kind of reluctantly thrust into this position of, of having to take more responsibility for the, for the army. And uh, with the death of Lysias, there was a kind of power vacuum, as it were, and his most senior general in the East was this guy called Avidius Cassius, who seemed to have seized the opportunity uh, a little bit later in 175 AD to have himself actually acclaimed emperor. So then there were, he was actually technically an emperor at that point, although not for very long. Um, and there was a civil war. We don't have many, we don't really have any account of any fighting that took place. So it's, it's unknown to what extent um, there were actually any battles, although I think that there possibly were. Um, Marcus, we're told, gave a speech where he offered to pardon everybody that had been involved in this uprising. And Cassius seems like more of a hawkish figure. Um, he was known as a strict disciplinarian as well. And that is partly why he'd been sent to the East to instill discipline in some of the, the, the weaker troops that, that they were stationed in the East of the Empire. Um, and I think some people at Rome were kind of fed up with the amount of time that Marcus was taking to resolve the, the Marcomannic uh, War. 
But that was because Marcus seemed to place a lot of emphasis on diplomacy and the negotiation of peace treaties and, you know, kind of organising uh, stability in the region. So it was a longer, slower, more gradual, painstaking process. And I think perhaps the impression I get is that Cassius and people like him just thought maybe we should just go and suppress these guys more violently and put an end to um, the fighting once and for all. But I think Marcus was thinking more in terms of the longer term picture. But uh, Cassius uh, eventually, after about three months, we believe, um, was assassinated by two of his own officers. And I think they realised that they couldn't win against the loyalist army that was marching against them. And Marcus had said, look, I'm going to pardon all of you guys. So they basically thought, well, we don't have any reason to fight anymore. Like, we've weighed this up and we reckon we're, we're, there's a pro probability we're going to lose. Um, Cassius wanted to continue fighting and they, I guess they said, well, if you want to die, put, you know, be our guest. So they chopped the, his head off and delivered it to Marcus Aurelius in a bag. And that was the end of the Civil War. And Marcus was as good as his word and he pardoned pretty much everybody that was involved in it. Um, so you could say that, that Marcus seemed to have been impressed by the fact that the legions in parts of the Eastern Empire, uh, in Cappadocia, or modern-day Turkey, remained loyal to him. Um, I think there was some question over that. Um, maybe they'd been involved in some fighting or something. Or Cassius had thought that he could win them over to his side. So they were honoured after the war for their loyalty to the emperor. And so the troops in general seem to have been very loyal to Marcus, although he'd nearly died of illness just prior to this. So there was some kind of question uh, over whether he'd survive. And whereas Cassius's troops, you know, although he'd instilled this kind of strict discipline in him, they didn't seem to like him very much, you know, and they were quite happy to do away with him if it served their interests. Yeah, I think you bled in there to the next question. I know you give a, a very good kind of breakdown in your book between the command styles of Marcus Aurelius and how he treated his troops versus Cassius and how that ultimately ended up with, well, how their armies followed them or how much loyalty they displayed. Um, I think you use a great quote in the book, now I'm going to get it wrong probably off the top of my head, where Marcus Aurelius says, we have to take men as they are because yeah. essentially we would want perfect men, but we can't make perfect men, so we have to find good uses for men that have their flaws and are human fundamentally. We have to, we, uh, we have to make the best use of them that we can. Like, we can't expect people to be perfect. The Stoics were very much realists like that. That's a big theme in Stoicism is that this idea that nobody is a sage and kind of accepting people's flaws and trying to work with them regardless, make the best of the, uh, the situation as it were. And Marcus was known for not being a pushover, but like known for, for uh, clemency, um, uh, and, you know, and... Uh, he even, and this is, there are some really quite remarkable things that Cassius Dio claims that Marcus said, and one of them is uh, that he said that he would have been willing uh, if uh, Cassius had uh, challenged him to have appeared before the Senate and have stood down as emperor, which is remarkable. Um, he said uh, if Cassius could make a strong enough case in, in front of the Senate, then I, I would have been willing to stand down. Yeah. So this kind of, yeah, the, he, he didn't behave like an autocrat. Yeah. Which is remarkable because I, I think a lot of people question whether or not that would have really happened or not. But just the thought that... Yeah, who knows, but the very can. suggestion of it. Yeah. Well, I'd like to move on to some of the great kind of practical self-development techniques that you gave. Um, and one of which kind of really struck me in terms of the instruction of Marcus Aurelius when he was a young man. And you make a point of making a clear distinction between uh, rhetoric and philosophy and being instructed. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about that? Well, this really goes all the way back to Socrates. It's a big theme in the Socratic dialogues. And I, it might be helpful actually to say that in one of the Platonic dialogues, Socrates actually goes as far as to say that often what the sophists do, um, and the sophists mainly specialised in oratory and rhetoric, they taught people how to speak well, um, to win arguments in the political assembly or in court. And they taught them the art of public speaking and the art of speech writing and also general um, culture. Um, and the best way of explaining it is that our word sophistication like, is what the 
the sophists sought to impart. They wanted to make people fluent and powerful speakers and impart a degree of cultural sophistication to young aristocrats, as it were. And uh, Socrates said, look, the sophists often sound like they're doing philosophy. They, give, they, they may even borrow ideas from philosophers, they'll talk about virtue and stuff, but their job is to win applause from large crowds and so they're crowd pleasers essentially that's the very nature of their profession and so they'll say whatever sounds good and uh, you know if it doesn't get a round of applause then they'll drop it like and they'll rephrase it and substitute something else it's kind of like the pretense or appearance of philosophy rather than doing real philosophy and socrates said look when you're doing real philosophy sometimes people aren't going to like what you tell them you know, people don't always like the truth. You know, it might rock the boat, for example. So the, the, although it looks the same sometimes on the surface, um, sophistry or rhetoric and philosophy have fundamentally divergent goals. One of them's all about winning a claim. The other one's about actually getting to the truth. Now, Marcus lived during a period uh, of, of a cultural phenomenon called the second sophistic, when Greek... Uh, culture became very popular in the Roman Empire. It was trendy. Um, and so emperors like Hadrian were surrounded by uh, orators and sophists who taught them to become cultured. And that was something that Roman aristocrats would pride themselves on. And it was expected as Marcus, part of Marcus's job that he had to give speeches and write letters. And so his education involved uh, like very intense training in Greek and Latin, Latin rhetoric by two of the leading, the, well, the two leading experts of his lifetime, Herodes Atticus and Marcus Cornelius Fronto. Um, but Marcus gradually became, it seems that he seems to have gone through this kind of inner turmoil as to, to whether he should be committing his life more to the pursuit of philosophy. And there was a kind of battle, that's usually how it's understood by scholars, between his main rhetoric teacher, uh, Fronto, and his main philosophy mentor, Junius Rusticus. And eventually, Rusticus won over. And Marcus, although he continued to study rhetoric, became more fundamentally committed to the life and, and values of Stoic philosophy. Well, I think it's a really important point, especially for military leaders to have that concept where it's, it's not only kind of speaking pretty and being able to influence people, but it's the, the secondary aspect of, hey, you have to live by whatever you're, you're talking about and display the virtues that you're calling uh, soldiers to live by. So in the book, you also talk about the concept of stress inoculation, and it was really interesting because you kind of tell this story of uh, Marcus Aurelius when he was a young man uh, attempting to sleep like a legionary. So throw a mat down on the ground, you throw a pelt over it, and you sleep on the pelt, not on soft beds or linens. And then uh -huh. you talk about his mother trying to kind of convince yeah, him to his mom told sleep on the couch. <laughs> uh, but could you talk about uh, stress inoculation, um, why we want to do it, and kind of some modern ways of how we might do it? Well, let me digress a little bit to begin with and, and say a lot about the, the modern psychology of it. Stress inoculation is a term that was introduced by a psychologist called Donald Meekenbaum. Um, he was a behavioural therapist um, who did a lot of pioneering work in the 1970s. And Meekenbaum's approach is called the coping skills approach sometimes. So it, it involves like being a, inoculated um, against a virus. you would expose yourself to small doses of stress or stressful situations in a graduated manner. So you pick situations that might cause you stress, like public speaking, and you start off with a smaller group and then maybe work up to a bigger group. Or you might start off doing it in your imagination and then start doing it in reality. Um, so you pick something that's going to be stressful for you and do it in graduated steps and stages, exposing yourself to the situation progressively more. And in Meekenbaum's approach, you would then also learn coping skills like relaxation techniques or ways of thinking about the situation or assertiveness skills that you would progressively rehearse in the situation so that you become more and more able to cope. So practice makes perfect kind of thing. And by doing that, you build up a level of resilience um, or uh, you strengthen your coping, uh, coping ability in stressful situations. Um, we do also know now, though, that when people confront stressful situations, perhaps the most robust 
mechanism, therapeutic mechanism is what we call emotional habituation. So even if you don't learn any coping skills, and those could be mental or behavioral coping skills, even if you do nothing at all, um, anxiety will normally abate naturally. So usually that's our go-to approach for phobias and things like that now, is for people just to sit out the anxiety until it wears off naturally. But we may also train people on certain coping skills as well. So, for example, if people are anxious about social situations, it may be that they need to learn ways of interacting with people's social skills that they practice over time. Whereas for an animal phobia, it might just be a matter of waiting for the anxiety to gradually wear off so that it permanently uh, becomes habituated. And the Stoics, um, like their predecessors, the Cynics, were very into this idea of voluntary hardship, that by exposing ourselves to difficult, painful or uncomfortable situations, that we'd be able to generally toughen ourselves up and build mental and physical uh, resilience. And, you know, the Stoics then kind of evolved this into a, a more of an imaginal technique, which we call pre premeditatio malorum, or the premeditation of adversity. So the Stoics talk about every day, they say, visualizing catastrophes or misfortunes or setbacks as if they're happening now, like death, poverty, exile, persecution, uh, illness, and so on, uh, you know, ultimately even facing the prospect of our own death. So that by imagining it as if it's happening and now, patient, patiently, repetitively, in a controlled manner, the Stoics' feelings of anxiety about these threats, which are the common lot of mankind, as it were, would become habituated and wear off. But the Stoics would also rehearse a kind of certain psychological coping strategies, as it were, using their philosophy to develop indifference towards things that they saw as being externals. So they had various cognitive strategies, ways of reframing these situations. So they, they must have realised that the mere fact of imagining these things would in just a certain level of calm if they were patient enough, but they also practice thinking about them from different perspectives. And I, we, we've kind of touched a little bit on the idea of modelling in Stoicism. Or, um, we talked earlier about how book one of the meditations involves Marcus describing his friends and family members and their virtues. So another thing that Stoics would do would be to um, ask themselves what Socrates or Zeno would do in a situation like this. And we use this today, we call this modelling, uh, coping. So they would imagine poverty or exile and then think about how Socrates or one of the heroes would cope with that situation and imagine themselves rehearsing similar attitudes and behaviours. So I think you walked into another <laughs> great question that I want to ask you is uh, you talk or at least present the idea kind of this well, you used the term modeling. Yeah. I, when I first read it, I'm like, it's kind of an invisible version of mentoring. Yeah. And I know that in the military, mentors are kind of few and far between because maybe in the Army we haven't established a good process to learn from mentors, the really good ones. There's not enough of them. They really spread the practice um, throughout the military or various other organizations in our society. But it was the thought of um, purposely taking a look at Kind of the mentors are heroes, um, very carefully looking yeah. at their virtues and then trying to imagine kind of whatever you're doing throughout the day to say, what would this person think of what I'm doing and whether that's a real mentor that you had in real life or one of the great characters, um, which was well, a fascinating idea, to say the least. This is definitely a big theme in Stoicism. Like the Stoics seem to have thought that the best way to teach philosophy is by leading by example, as it were, and providing other people with a role model. So they lectured and wrote books, but they seem to think, you know, what's even more valuable is being able to, to see somebody. Um, Zeno is their kind of ultimate role model, as it were, within the school, but even beyond that, they, they generally hold up Socrates as being one of their ideal role models. So, and we can see Marcus also modeling people that he knows personally. Uh, learning from their example. And it also doesn't have to be somebody that's perfect. Like there, there are people, even his own brother, who uh, by many accounts was like a, a, a terrible role model. Marcus nevertheless is able to identify, you know, some aspects of his character that are worth learning from. So um, there are many different ways that we can do this. It could be that we have an excellent mentor. We have a book by Galen, Marcus's physician, which describes in a lot more detail than the Stoics, than the surviving Stoic texts do, 
this kind of process of philosophical mentoring. And, and Gillen says you should be trying really hard to find a good mentor for yourself if you can. Um, ideally, he says it would be someone that's older because the simple fact that that then allows you to you know, look at their life overall and see whether they've consistently lived in accord with virtue. You know, they're kind of tried and tested, as it were, and so you know that the, their attitudes might be healthy ones that are worthy of emula uh, emulation. But uh, the Stoics also clearly recognize that you, you don't always have access to role models. And in fact, when Marcus had to go to the, the northern frontier, he, you know, when he came here, actually, you know, perhaps, perhaps where I'm seated right now, you know, maybe Marcus at one point was walking outside there. He, he was, he seems to have been pretty much isolated from his Stoic teachers. And also, uh, Junius Rusticus probably died around 170 AD, as far as we're aware. And I, I think, you know, this would have been a big, in a sense, a crisis or an upheaval for Marcus. I think he would have then had to fall back more on his own psychological resources. I believe that may even be why he started writing the meditations to become his own inner therapist or coach or mentor after the loss of his, his real life mentor. And so the Stoics have these various strategies. We can model real people that we know. We can take imperfect people and just focus on certain aspects of their character. Um, we could think of historical figures, such as Socrates, and model what we know about them from history. We could even take fictional characters uh, and learn something from the, uh, the example set by fictional characters. And also the Stoics say we can also approach it as a, a, a psychological exercise in constructing uh, an ideal or hypothetical sage. And we can see instances where Marcus seems to be doing that. He's not really talking about any real or even fictional specific character. He's just trying to imagine what the hypothetical ideal sage would do in a, a particular situation. It's a slightly more abstract, perhaps, way of approaching modeling, but nevertheless, it, you know, there's a place for that as well. You give an interesting analogy in the book where uh, you said that everyone can tell when a singer is really terrible, yeah. like it's really easy, but it takes a kind of a master to learn, uh, to find the subtle mistakes in like a, a good or proficient singer. And then you relate that to looking at virtue in terms of the Stoics kind of increase the, um, I'm trying to think of the correct term, but just the awareness or um, kind of the attention to detail about examining the character or virtue of the people around them and kind of the more they did that practice, the better they were at kind of detecting kind of flaws or um, errors, if that makes sense. Yeah, and in a sense, a, you know, like a life coach or a therapist or a counselor might to some extent play that role for somebody. And the Stoics and Galen talk about the, the fact that we found someone who's experienced and wiser and we, we're honest with them, almost like a confession, and we invite them to give us feedback means that we're more likely to get more penetrating insight and more more useful feedback from people but also with experience as we work on our own character we'll get better at spotting flaws that we have a, a blind spot to galen says something very interesting about this actually uh, which he says he refers to plato he says that uh, plato says that lovers are blind um, and so when we love someone we don't notice their flaws but most people love themselves uh, first and foremost, so they're particularly blind when it comes to their own flaws. And also he mentions one of Aesop's fables, where uh, the flaws of everybody else in the world are suspended in a big sack in front, we're from birth in front of us, metaphorically, but our own flaws are hung behind our back so that we can't really see them very clearly, but everyone else can. Um, and so Galen says, look, this is the basic problem. We seem to have this kind of blind spot for our own flaws, and that's why we, we need to get help from somebody else. But if we don't have a mentor or a therapist or a coach or somebody else, you know, how do we then do this? That That's that's a particularly hard challenge if we're working on our own, right? I think that's what you were alluding to. Um, and there are tricks that we can pull um, to help ourselves gain that kind of perspective shift and distance and just the working on things over time and consistently I think we develop more insight but mindfulness and self-awareness training practices can help as well in therapy one of the most powerful things a therapist can do is say a client suffers from worry like they might have generalized anxiety disorder which we is a pathological worrying disorder for instance but the very nature of certain problems such as worrying um, are that people get lost in thought um, they maybe don't even hear the telephone ring or something. They can be so engrossed in their thoughts 
and you know uh, they don't really notice what they're doing with their body as well. So a therapist might say to a client, "Well, what, what's your facial expression like when you're worrying? What do you actually do with your hands? Like literally, what do you actually do with your hands when you're beginning to worry? Do you clench them or are they relaxed? Are you fidgeting with them or not? You know, or is there one hand that you're kind of fidgeting with and not the other? And these seem like really strange questions to clients. They're, they're going to say, "I don't know, I don't know, I don't know." But by asking them, it makes people more attuned to notice what they are actually doing, right? They'll be on the lookout for it. Um, and people often frown when they begin to worry. So the therapist might say, well, do you frown? Do you notice that you're doing that? Do you do anything with your teeth? Like, what's your facial expression like? What would it seem like to someone else? What's happening with your eyes? Do you close them? Do you gaze into the middle distance? Are they kind of darting around the room? So by asking lots of really specific questions like that, we can increase someone's self-consciousness, as it were. And that can really interfere with the process of worrying. And it also can make people more likely to notice that they're beginning to do it at an earlier, an earlier stage. So sometimes therapists like Meekenbaum uh, call these early warning signs. And by noticing them, um, we stand a much better chance of derailing the, the chain of behaviours that lead us to become lost in what the Stoics would call a passion, such as worrying. We prevent it from escalating. So one way is just asking ourselves to notice these subtle cues that we might not have noticed before and just making an effort to pose these kind of questions, odd questions, they might seem like, but helpful. And another one is to have a daily routine where uh, in the morning the Stoics would plan their day ahead and kind of mentally rehearse what it would be like to act with wisdom and self-discipline throughout the day that they expect to be facing. And then in the evening, they would follow this Pythagorean practice of uh, closing their eyes and kind of mentally reviewing the main sequence of events, what order they encountered different people and how they responded and asking themselves three questions. Um, what did you do uh, badly? What did you do well? And what could you do differently next time? And my experience is that by reviewing things at the end of the day, people become more self-conscious. So throughout the day, they think, oh, I'm going to have to evaluate this and critique it later tonight. So they're more likely to catch themselves and spot when they're about to get angry or they're about to engage in worry or they're about to become depressed because they know they're going to have to answer to someone for it later, albeit answering to themselves. So that little psychological trick, I think, can help people. But they're acting almost like their future self is acting kind of like a mentor that they're going to be answerable to. And I can imagine that process would also increase kind of our own emotional intelligence with dealing with yeah. others. And I think that in the book you talk about it's easy to tell if someone's mad, but like a, a sage can depict before someone gets upset because of the kind of these subtle cues and that might help us better interact with the people around us that we can kind of determine when they're, whether or not they're acting out of yeah, passion. Yeah, absolutely. Not. So I must say, this is a, a truly remarkable book that I wish that I could hand to every young lieutenant in the Army. Uh, we barely covered uh, the various different topics in there that even are related to the military, much less the larger concept, because I know in this book you also talk about pain management strategies that I could imagine being extremely useful for not only yeah. soldiers just kind of dealing with everyday fatigue of the battlefield to the, the people at home dealing with chronic pain. Um, I, yeah, just the, some of the techniques that you talk about in terms of building resistance and, um, whatnot, uh, the, the, really the call to focus on the virtue. Um, I think that if we could introduce this type of philosophy, to military leaders early on in their career can drastically shape them, especially since we know how much this had very positive impacts on the strategy that Marcus Aurelius was able to use. Um, throughout his career, uh, his military kind of... Well, you know, actually, it might be useful to, to paint the picture like this. You know, my impression is Marcus, it, it, this is unusual, but Marcus had no military experience. Uh, most no Roman nobles would have served as a tribune um, and they would have kind of worked their way up through the ranks. They would have had some military experience. As far as we know, Marcus didn't have any. And in fact, he'd, he seldom really left Rome um, or, or at least Italy, um, until the Marcomannic Wars broke out. And like I said, it was when his adopted brother and co-emperor died that he, he seems reluctantly 
have to have been forced into his possession. But it was a trial by fire. Like he, he was suddenly put in command of the largest army ever massed on a Roman frontier. We we estimate in total it, it would have maybe been 140,000 men stationed along the Danube. So he was kind of cast into this role that he wasn't prepared for at all. And Avidius Cassius, who had the, the civil war with him, we know referred to him as a philosophical old woman. Like he seemed to have thought that he was kind of unsuited um, for this type of role. And so I imagine that at the beginning of the First Marcomannic War, Marcus probably really felt like a fish out of water when he arrived uh, at Carnuntum um, and saw the, you know, the troops massed before him. And, you know, he must have felt, you know, like, I'm not really prepared for this. But, you know, we, we know that as the war progressed, uh, he developed, the troops became steadfastly loyal to him and they developed much more respect for him. Um, and later in the war, they, they absolutely idolise him as the, the uh, commander-in-chief and as a general. Uh, they, they attributed two battlefield miracles to him. In fact, the rain miracle and the, and the, the thunder miracle. Uh, so he, I imagine that he kind of went through this progression and he seems to have, you know, despite being quite physically frail and sickly, nevertheless, he put himself at the front line like, and he embraced his role and he became respected for that. And he would have been considered incredibly aged for his time period. He lived a remarkably long life for being kind of Pretty, well, fairly long. In, yeah, given the circumstances, there was a you know, especially given the plague and the wars, like a lot of people, especially who were involved in the military, wouldn't have made it to he made it to nearly fifty nine. He was approaching sixty. Um, and for example, his son Commodus was assassinated at 31. Uh, Lucius Verus, I think, was maybe in his late 30s when he died. Um, so we can see that the, uh, so the people around him, especially ones in the military, like, tended to, to die younger at that period in time. I think you, you do a beautiful job introducing Stoicism in this book in a way that it's real in terms of it's you really capture the kind of the overarching uh, storyline of Marcus Aurelius. You present most of the Stoic philosophies, but you do it in a way that, which I found fascinating, was here's the philosophy, here's kind of Marcus Aurelius's story, and then you give the kind of back half. This is how you can apply it today, and these are the modern psychological terms that we're now using, and you make um, kind of Stoicism more accessible um, to the everyday reader, which I appreciate. Um, I know that I carried the copy of the meditations with me when I deployed um, to Iraq. I hadn't studied Stoicism before I, had, well, I studied Stoicism, but not to any heavy degree before I deployed. Um, and I did appreciate the carrying meditations with me and passing that book around uh, my unit. And I think this book might be even a better introduction to the general concepts and especially in the way that you connect the old philosophy with the new um, psychological terms and the fact that this is a great book to kind of open the door to exploring this area. In a way, what I wanted to do is, like, I love the meditations, you know, I think it's a, a book that everyone should read. And in writing this book, I, I kind of wanted to introduce more people to the meditations and motivate them to read it. And also wanted to help people that have already read the meditations to, to kind of get more out of it by learning more about the significance of some of the things that he's saying and viewing it more within its historical context. You know, I feel like people can get maybe twice as much out of it if they learn a little bit more of the background. So I know that you have several other books and you run several other kind of social media platforms. Could you tell the audience a few places where they can find you and learn more about stuff? Well, uh, if you go to my website, it's just my name, donaldrobertson.name, not .com, but .name. And that, I've got a blog there and links to an e-learning site that I have. My e-learning site is just learn.donaldrobertson.name. And there are a bunch of free courses there, and as well as a, a, some bigger courses and paid courses on Socrates and Marcus Aurelius. And I'm also a member, one of the founding members of the Modern Stoicism Organization, which is a non-profit um, that does research on Stoicism and, and distributes information about Stoicism applied to modern living. It was founded in 2012 by Chris Gill, who's Professor Emeritus of Ancient Thought at the University of Exeter in England. And we have several sort of well-known authors, 
uh, academics, psychologists and so on on our, on our team. It's a multidisciplinary team. So Modern Stoicism's website is just Modern Stoicism, all, all one word, dot com. And we run a, an annual conference called Stoicon and uh, we have an annual online event called Stoic Week that people can take part in. It's free of charge. So donaldrobson.name is my website and modernstoicism.com is the, the non-profit organization's website where there's a, a lot of resources. There are, there are over 500 articles by dozens of different authors on that website as well about almost every aspect of stoicism that you can imagine. Well, I have one last question huh? for you. So now that you finished this absolutely beautiful book, do you have any ideas for future projects or what you might yeah, do? Yeah, um, the next thing that we're probably going to do, I'm 99% sure um, that the next book is going to be a graphic novel, which I kind of stumbled into by chance. Um, and uh, I have an illustrator that I work with called Z in Portugal. And we've done some little samples already, but we've almost got a, a book deal confirmed to do the graphic novel, which would also be about the life and philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. Um, so I'm hoping that's what I'm going to be working on over the summer. I'm also organising the, the next Stoicon conference, incidentally, which is going to be in Athens, where I'm going in a couple of days' time from now. Um, and uh, and then hopefully after that, you know, my other big interest is Socrates and the relationship between Socrates and Stoicism. So uh, this, this is a little bit further down the line, but I'm hoping to get a chance to write a book about Socrates and how his philosophy could be of practical relevance. A little bit like this book, actually, um, but focused on, on Socrates. And in particular, I'm interested in what Socrates has to say about friendship and relationships, the more kind of interpersonal side of, of self-improvement. Well, I deeply appreciate your work in the philosophy and making these uh, materials more readily accessible in an easily understood and entertainable format. So I look forward to seeing uh, your future Awesome. Work. Thank you very much for having me on your, on your video, uh, your vlog, is that the right term? Having me on your vlog, Franklin. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> yeah, it's always a Cheers. pleasure. Uh, for, for the audience out there, I encourage you to definitely take a look at this book. I know that... Uh, it will be released, I believe, second the second April, of April right. is when I got told. Yep, when I got told by Amazon that my half a dozen books that I ordered will be arrive at my doorstep. Uh, between now and then, I know that it's running a discount on at least Amazon and mm -hmm. Barnes and Noble. Uh, so get it while the, the price is cheap and save yourself. Yeah, yeah, you can get it cheaper sometimes uh, if you pre-order it. Uh, but otherwise, I encourage everyone to, to take a look at this. Um, and take a look into the concepts of philosophy. I, I do believe it's a kind of missing link in military education that is critically important the more that you increase in rank um, and ability uh, in terms of leadership. But with that, I encourage the audience to continue exploring and focusing on their self-development uh, so we can make sure that we can dominate the modern battlefield. Thank you. Thanks very much.